Hi, I'm Tony Braun with Williams AV, and I have the pleasure of leading the sales and marketing teams here at Williams. I'm with Brian Bunkenberg, our global senior product manager. Welcome, Brian. Thank you, Tony. Great to be here. So for 50 years, Williams has uh, innovated on different technology platforms to make spaces more inclusive. And one of the areas that uh, is getting a lot of attention in uh, recent months is Bluetooth technology and some evolution there. So, Brian, why don't we start there? Can you give us a little history about Bluetooth and what has led us up to today where we're hearing more about something called Bluetooth LE or low energy? Great, yeah, let's do that. Let's take a step back. Um, first of all, uh, Bluetooth has been around for 25 years or, or actually longer than that. Um, and over that time, they've had five major releases with sub-releases of the technology. Okay. So versions one, two, and three of Bluetooth are referred to as Bluetooth Classic. Okay. Uh, with version 4.0, uh, they, they introduced something called low energy or LE. So that's been around for a good amount of time. Um, so 4 and 5 are both low energy uh, focused uh, uh, releases, versions. Uh, 4 is mostly focused on data. It had audio, but it was really focused on Internet of Things and, and data improvements for low energy. Mm -hmm. What's exciting today is, what we, is version 5.2. 5.2 really built on uh, what they've done in other versions, but really uh, focused on audio quality and new features that are exciting to our marketplace. Uh, things like uh, broadcast, for example. Broadcast is the ability to transmit from one to many receivers within a, uh, within a space just like an FM radio. Wow. So there's no longer any pairing required from device, device, device. It's a one to many transmission. Uh, that gives the, uh, uh, the end user the ability to have an unlim unlimited number of receivers in a given space. It's no longer uh, necessary to qualify and, and, and pair them, as, as I mentioned. Um, they really focus it also on the audio quality. So high audio quality with low latency is, is really important to this 5.2 standard. Um, they've also increased the range, so that's important. Uh, another interesting feature that I think we'll take advantage of is, is simultaneous audio streams. So the ability to send a, multiple channels over a single audio stream to the end user. So what that provides is the ability to do stereo. Mm -hmm. You'd have left uh, ear and one channel, one other ear on uh, right ear on the channel. other channel, and come through simultaneously. That also provides you the ability maybe for multi-language support, interpretation, where English, Spanish, and Italian, for example, may come over the same audio channel. You, you mentioned two things in that description uh, that gets people's attention relative mm -hmm. to Bluetooth. Mm -hmm. One is latency. Yep. And the other one is range, both of which I think have been limiting factors for the use of Bluetooth in pro AV spaces. So can you talk more about what version 5.2 or LE means to latency and range? Well, version 5.0, 5.1, and 5.2 all had improvements in range. Um, so the range uh, that they're promoting is uh, upwards of 200 meters. Historically, Bluetooth has been a 10 to 30 meter kind right. of technology, one to one pairing. This is now up to 100 to 200 meters, depending on how the manufacturer in implements it. Right, right. And latency? Latency. Um, again, they're really focused on high audio quality. Um, and so the standard and what you'll see in the industry is people talking about less than 40 millisecond latency. Excellent. For Bluetooth or Oracast. Yeah, always very important when we're talking about hearing assistance for live events or yep. when watching something on a monitor. Yep. So those who've been following the Bluetooth SIG or special interest group have been hearing more about this thing called Oracast. Uh, can, you, can you talk to us about Oracast relative to Bluetooth LE? What is Oracast? Great question. Um, so again, uh, release uh, version 5.2, actually uh, they established 20 spe specifications uh, around audio interoperability and quality. Okay. So, um, which is exciting to us in the industry. So interoperability is, is key to this thing going forward. Um, but one of those 20 specs is called the basic audio profile. And within the basic audio profile is the public broadcast profile. There's a public and a private version. The public broadcast public broadcast profile. That's a tongue really, twister. It is a tongue twister. <laughs> That's why they changed it to Oracast. The public <laughs> broadcast profile, yeah. That's really Oracast. And Oracast originally was named uh, Bluetooth Audio Sharing, but they rebranded it. Okay. Uh, because they wanted to communicate more effectively the benefits and the great excitement they had around these use cases for 5.2 and beyond. So Oracast is really the branding of Bluetooth audio sharing to the marketplace, and it's exciting. It's super exciting. I mean, one to many is going to open up a lot more applications, especially when you think about that many different channels. So, so imagine we're in an Oracast-enabled venue. We walk into the space with an Oracast-enabled device. How does it work? How does somebody know that the space is 
accessible? How do we know and, and get connected to an audio stream? Well, that's a great question because one thing you mentioned there is important, an Oracast enabled device. In order to be compliant with Oracast, it has to be Bluetooth 5.2 or later, uh, as well as uh, Oracast on the name. So it has to have all those three names either in the description or the name branding mm -hmm. for it to be in or about operable and compliant to the standard. Got it. Um, so when you walk in, uh, the Bluetooth SIG has, has identified a uh, defined and assistant technologies. So the assistant actually forces the radio that your unit is listening to to scan for Oracast channels. It'll scan and tell you every channel that's in the space and present them to the user as a selection. Okay. So just like you would in a car radio, 97.5 will show up or Bob's transmitter or you know, English will show up as available channel, channel to the end name. users. Yeah. The user then selects that channel and listens to the audio. Got it. Got it. Makes sense. So looking into the future a little bit here, that's always the, the harder part, the yeah. crystal ball exercise. What do you think that uh, this new capability um, is going to mean in terms of Bluetooth LE with the Oracast standard applied? What do you think that's going to mean to the pro AV market? Well, I, I think the biggest benefit to the pro AV Pro AV market is going to be uh, the ability for end users to bring their own devices. Mm -hmm. So if these devices become prevalent in the marketplace, they'll start demanding that Bluetooth be installed. Um, but similar to like we have today with Wi-Fi, where uh, users are, can bring their own devices and have an application, um, it's been a growth for us in the for, last for few sure. years, which yes. is great. Uh, the ability to have that BYOD capability is going to be important to their customers. Um, once they have that BYOD capability, more people use it. Uh, they'll probably have less uh, time maintaining their system. So less, mm -hmm. they'll still need to have that dedicated device to hand out, but maybe they'll hand it out less because more people will have their own user devices. That makes sense. So to make a space more inclusive, you want people to be comfortable with the device they're yep. using. And when that can be their own device, that has a, a lot of benefits. Excellent. So talk about the types of environments that you think, or, or even markets, that you think will be early adopters of this technology. It's a great question. Uh, a lot of people are debating that today uh, in a lot of different companies, including right. here. Um, <laughs> uh, I think we're going to focus a little bit on uh, two areas, categories. Markets that are more technology savvy, more attuned to their technology, right. and markets that are more focused on audio quality. Um, so for example, the first uh, might be education, where the uses are students that are really uh, taking advantage of their devices today, mm -hmm. using their technology, all aspects of the technology, and just as importantly, changing out those devices on a more regular Frequently, basis. Yeah. So um, they have the ability to then jump into Oracast a little bit quick, more quickly. Uh, the second example of uh, audio quality might be uh, theater, where they want every user to have an experience that is as good as every other user, and they right. want to maximize that experience. So this may be a benefit for them moving yeah. forward. With the multiple channels of audio that are possible, right? We tend to think of it as one channel, one one transmitter paired with one device today, but with multiple channels of audio, what other applications do you think are, are really going to uh, look towards or lean into this technology? Well, one they've already defined in the standard is, is stereo, where you have a left channel and a right channel being transmitted to the user right. over the same uh, audio stream. Um, but probably more effective, more important to us is uh, interpretation. Mm -hmm. So interpretation, they have English, Spanish, uh, Italian, whatever, uh, broadcast at the same time simultaneously over the same audio stream. Got it. Yeah, lots of new, lots of new possibilities. So, with uh, with as this technology evolves, um, people are going to have to make a choice between: Do I lean into this new technology, or do I rely on some of the the proven technologies that they've received from Williams and others for for years? Things like FM, infrared, hearing loop, Wi-Fi. So, what are some of the advantages to Bluetooth and Oracast? that might have someone adopt this technology versus a uh, more traditional technology? Well, I, again, I think the, the first uh, and most important is the ability to bring your own device. Mm -hmm. So people uh, that have need assistance hearing bring their own devices, but there's also something where, where people bring their own devices to hear better, to focus better, so more of an assistive communication. Right. So bringing your own device, being comfortable with that device, and being able to focus better is an important aspect of this. Um, another area is, uh, this is a standalone system. It's like an FM system has a transmitter to multiple receivers. It's not connected to your infrastructure if you don't want it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, that means it does not consume any Wi-Fi bandwidth, which is important to a good set segment of our customers. Again, it's a standalone system. Uh, it's going to be easier to install than other technologies like Loop. Mm -hmm. Loop is a great product. It's a great technology. 
What challenge you can you're, install. Yep, if you're ready and, and able to do an install of that type. Exactly. Yep, and on the Wi-Fi technology, you, you made a good point that not everybody has the ability to run that on their existing network, either because of settings or protocol or, or just traffic in general. Right. So right. This, this brings a new option to that. Um, so can you talk about whether or not this technology, when it, when it becomes uh, available and mainstream, will it help people meet the disability uh, legislation for making spaces accessible and inclusive? That's, uh, that's another good debate being held in the marketplace today uh, and, and compliance to assistive listening uh, standards or regulations. Um, when those devices are broadly available uh, mm -hmm. and, use, and in use by people, they'll demand to transmitters to be installed for assistive listening. Right. Uh, those systems, again, will need to be properly designed and configured as they do today for assistive listening. Um, and, and just as importantly, the facilities, once they get those installed, will have to have the ability to hand out devices for those that don't have assistive listening devices and still require that. So the regulations still require them to have that ability to have a dedicated device to hand out. Got it. Got it. Um, so let's talk about the timing of Bluetooth, LE, and AuraCast. I'm sure the information you've presented today is, is new information for a lot of people. So talk to us about what you've talked to people all over the world, what you think timing looks like. When do you think, what helps build momentum? When do you think early adopters are going to look at this? When is this mainstream? It's a great question. Uh, and we look at this very closely because we look at uh, several areas. Um, we talked about consumer. When, is the cons when are the devices going to be available? Mm -hmm. When are the consumers going to accept adopt, them yeah. and adopt them? Uh, what cycles of technology changeover do they, do they allow, allow them to happen? The same thing happens with hearing aid manufacturers. We talked about one manufacturer being in the marketplace today. Uh, once we have more manufacturers in the place, in the marketplace, maybe all of them in the marketplace, um, you'll start hearing more and more uh, pull from, the, from that side of the business. Mm -hmm. um, people I've talked to in the industry, and I just got back from the American Audio, Audiological Association conference, uh, trying to focus on what this might be. Early adopters, I think, are going you're going to start seeing those in the one to three year time frame. Mm -hmm. But that mass market, that mass convergence, that mass amount of uh, amount of uses in the marketplace is probably a three to five year time frame. And that's typical of what we've seen, right? We see uh, consumer devices or technologies build momentum, build adoption, build awareness, and then that leads to uh, the, the follow-on in pro AV spaces. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, so backing up one second, is Bluetooth and AuraCast in hearing aids today? Uh, yes and no. Okay. <laughs> uh, as, again, Bluetooth and hearing aids is not a new concept. It's been around since uh, maybe 2014. Mm -hmm. One of the early adoptions of for low energy was for hearing aids. It just didn't get there enough. It just didn't, the battery, the power usage is still too great for it to be a right. successful product broadly in the marketplace. Orcast is looking to change that. Um, so Orcast is gonna reduce the battery life significantly. And again, only one manufacturer today is in the marketplace. The others are um, in either some form of development or waiting for more things to happen. Um, we don't know the timing for but, that. But you expect others to fall I expect and that, offer this as well based on the energy savings and quality? They've all, they've all claimed that they support Orcast in right. some way, shape, or form. Some in the marketplace, some publicly in, in presentations, right. some behind the scenes. Got it. Excellent. Well, those are the questions that we had for you today, Brian. Thanks for sharing all of your experience with us. Okay. Williams AV continues to innovate with new technologies, and we fully expect to be uh, offering products in the not so distant future uh, that are AuraCast and Bluetooth enabled for the environments that, that can benefit from that kind of technology that look for that BYOD experience. So please follow us, uh, visit us at trade shows, keep an eye on our website, and you'll see more information coming from us as it relates to Bluetooth technology. Thank you.